Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I see we have a number of people joining. Um, so you're all very welcome to the launch of this concise guide for directors of owner management companies, a publication produced by Chartered Accountants Ireland and the Housing Agency. Um, my name's Corona Clohessy. I'm the public policy lead in Chartered Accountants Ireland, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. Um, I suppose considering the rise in the number of people living in multi-unit developments, there's an increasing focus on the quality and standards of a living accommodation that people should be entitled to. And we all know that directors of owner management companies play a vital role in that and in ensuring this quality and hopefully this guide will help with carrying out that duty. So before I introduce our speakers, I'm just going to give a run through of how the event will flow today. Um, Barry Dempsey, CEO of Chartered Accountants Ireland, will make some opening remarks. And then we're going to hear from the authors of the publication, <coughs> Neil Fitzgerald and David Roos. A panel discussion will then follow and John O'Connor, the Chief Executive of the Housing Agency, will close proceedings. So the event will last 45 minutes. We do promise to get you out of here by quarter to two. And um, the event will be recorded and will be made available afterwards. If you do have any technical difficulties, please do use the chat function. And um, that will go directly into our technical support of Tara Doyle and Sarah Kennedy. And we thank them both for their support today. Um, and I'm the guide will also importantly be available on the websites of both the Institute and the Housing Agency. So now if I could turn to Barry Dempsey, our CEO of Chartered Accountants Ireland, to open the event and I really do hope you enjoy the launch today. Thanks everyone. Thank you Krona. Uh, I'm delighted to add my welcome to yours. Uh, I know we have a tremendous number of participants registered uh, for this afternoon which is not surprising because uh, Quality housing, quality, quality residential accommodation, contemporary res residential accommodation is really, it's, uh, it's an issue of such massive importance. It's one of the big issues, uh, the big issues uh, uh, to be uh, discussed and addressed in Ireland, but also to be considered for the future. Uh, and so in this regard, I'm delighted that Chartered Accountants Ireland could participate in the collaboration with the Housing, housing Agency uh, on such a significant publication. It's a concise guide, frequently concise guides are not that concise. This one is 23 pages. So really uh, it, has, it has compacted everything that a owner managed company director could need to know uh, into this setting. Uh, and it's a brilliant resource for those who are uh, either working in the area or are volunteers in the area. So our thanks to John O'Connor, uh, Chief Executive of the Housing Agency and also to his colleague, David Roos, at the housing agency uh, for the opportunity to work on this project with them. We know, and Krona said it there in the introduction, increasing numbers of people in Ireland are living in apartments or houses that are part of multi-unit developments. And the directors and the owner managed companies themselves are really the custodians of the common areas, the shared amenities of these settings. Uh, all of us over the last 14 or 15 months will be struck by, uh, from the amount of time we have spent in our respective living environments, uh, just how important the physical environment around us, how important our, our built environment is, uh, and also how important shared amenities and services in those environments are, particularly in creating and maintaining sustainable communities. So this is just another side effect of the pandemic in terms of our perspective of it, uh, but nonetheless, it is part of how residential property, residential accommodation is evolving uh, that we, uh, we have a focus on the standards and we have a focus on the processes involved in delivering for these sustainable communities. As you know, in terms of the relevance to Chartered Accountants Ireland, many Chartered Accountants have roles in this field, either as directors of owner managed companies or in the provision of essential services to those OMCs. Fostering robust standards of governance in owner managed companies is therefore a topic of great importance to our profession. And indeed, it goes to the very heart of our societal obligations within Chartered Accountants Ireland. Our members have a responsibility that dates back to the Royal Charter under which we were established in 1888. Uh, but it also is in our current values and in our current strategy to act for the public benefit and to act in the public interest. So in this regard, this topic, this area of work couldn't be of more relevance to Chartered Accountants Ireland. I'd like to recognise the work of the authors of the Concise Guide, uh, Neil Fitzgerald of Chartered Accountants Ireland and David Roos of the Housing Agency. Thank them so much uh, for all 
their investment, their time and their contribution in producing the concise guide. And again, uh, thank you all for joining us here this afternoon. I'm happy to pass back to Krona, who will take you through the uh, take you through the proceedings now. Thank you, Barry. So we're going to head straight over to uh, the authors of the publication. Um, we have Niall, Neil Fitzgerald, he's Head of Ethics and Governance in Chartered Accountants Ireland, and he engages with regulators and standard setters on ethics and governance policy matters. David Rouse uh, from the Housing Agency, he's a multi-unit development advisor and is a voluntary director of an owner, ma owner's management company. So both have huge experience in this area. And uh, I they're going to talk through the, the guide for a few minutes. Um, so I'll hand you over to Neil. Uh, thank you, Corona, and thank you, Barry, for those opening remarks. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, this guide is 23 pages of conciseness, uh, which is a far cry from the uh, numerous uh, pages contained within legislation, etc. So the whole purpose and the objective of this guide, I guess, was to be practical and focused. And that's why we picked 10 key considerations, if you like, for owner management company directors. And first and foremost of, of those considerations includes directors' duties. And now the, the fact that directors are the, I suppose, they are ultimately responsible for actually what goes on within an organization. They, they, they bear that, uh, that responsibility for what happens. Uh, so we focus first and foremost on directors' duties, including not just in terms of the Companies Act, and, and, uh, but also in the context of the fiduciary duties that directors have to act in the best interest of the organization. So the first consideration within this guide actually focuses on what, what, how a director themselves can fulfill those, those responsibilities. And that's over to you, David. Apologies. <laughs> First, first rule of Zoom, turn on your mic. Uh, so so the, uh, absolutely, Neil, the, the uh, ultimate responsibility for, for the stewardship of the company does, of course, rest with, with, with the directors and they need to be conscious of, uh, the, I suppose, the Companies Act legislation and other legislation that, that can apply to their role, for example, health and safety or uh, local council, local government bylaws. Um, and, and I suppose a second consideration flowing from all that uh, is, is the board, uh, the board's effectiveness. So there needs to be a, a clarity on, on the board as to uh, the director's uh, roles. They need to understand that the board acts as a, a collective uh, collegiate uh, bo body. And while the individuals uh, are, are directors and volunteers, they're not alone in their, in their individual roles. They do act together as a, as a team, uh, as it were. And it's interesting that this week happens to be um, National Volunteer Week, so it is a happy coincidence that we lodged the, this uh, this guide in that in that uh, in, in that particular um, setting. But yeah, absolutely, the clarity as as to roles and responsibilities, particularly the roles of of the chair of the board uh, and the company secretary, and we come back to those. Um, but also in terms of uh, being an effective board, being prepared for meetings, having uh, uh, timely uh, preparation. Uh, that papers uh, that are uh, board papers are ready for for uh, board members to 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 consider in advance of the meeting, and that there's suitable induction uh, available to uh, available to members uh, who are joining the board new. Very true, David. And in fact, when David and I were actually compiling the content for this guide, we wanted to. This is the practical focus we were talking about. And board effectiveness is 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 a practical side of governance, if you like. It's not. It's it's. Board effectiveness is not as much about the regulation, which is important, uh, as it is about the people who actually put that regulation into effect. And uh, people are dynamic, and you know we're, we're not experts in everything. And indeed, a board does not contain all expertise or all knowledge of everything that they need to know about every piece of legislation. But they have common sense, and they apply that working together on the board to achieve consensus on the difficult issues, but also knowing when they've reached the limits of their expertise and when in fact to, they might need to outsource or engage expertise outside of the board. So board effect, this is, is that one of those practical considerations we're talking about at, at the outset. And indeed that kind of leads nicely into our third consideration within the guide, which is um, which suggests that the work of the board is not all about conformance, as I said, to rules and regulations and conformance to certain procedures, etc. It's also the directors play a leading role in the actual performance of the owner's management company. And, and equally flowing from, I suppose, that conformance um, piece is, is the structure 
uh, and, and having uh, having um, uh, the corporate documentation uh, in place. So section four of the guide uh, deals with uh, deals with the company constitution and the the register of members. Um, and, and I suppose ensuring that these documents are are in place in a in a suitable fashion um, to meet the to meet the needs of the individual OMC um, uh, is is, uh, is 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 key uh, from a corporate governance uh, perspective. Um, and uh, I, I suppose the 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 importance of the company constitution is it that it be customized and that and that it be uh, effective for for the purposes of the individual OMC and that. Uh, as as we echo through the the guide, the importance of receiving professional advice in relation to uh, preparation of of documents such as the such as the OMC uh, constitution. Uh, so we be I suppose we, we that that will be an important aspect to take into account. And equally, the robustness, completeness, and indeed concise is a word that that is that is that is featuring uh, featuring here. That, that 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 all those aspects are reflected in the. Uh, quality of the of the uh, register of members for for company members as well, uh, because effectively the the, the uh, register of members is like the electoral register. You could draw that parallel. If, so if people are uh, are seeking to 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 change things in the OMC or or voting on various measures, they need to they need to be uh, to be able to contact each other in that uh, in that respect. And I think that's it, David. I mean, the company constitution. It's much more than just a document. It's actually you know if if there's ever an issue. With the governance of an organization or if there's ever a dispute it's amazing how quickly the constitution is actually pulled out and looked at um because it actually sets out the rules if you like and regulations for internal governance of the organization and that includes the rights of the, the rights and the powers and duties of the directors but also the members whom the directors in this instance serve so the constitution is a very important document and uh, one of the things we, we, we would say is just beware of templates. Templates are useful. They're a good kickstart and they're a good, good starting point, if you like, to build your constitution from. But make sure the contents of that template are relevant to your actual owner's management company. Because one of the things we have to talk about here is proportionality. And, uh, you know, we, we, we don't need an all singing, all dancing set of rules and procedures like we would for a PLC for an owner's management company. But we do need to make sure that the document is effective and can be actually applied and be of practical use should you need to refer to it in, 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 in issues of uncertainty. Which kind of brings me, I suppose, back more into my comfort zone being a chartered accountant is our fifth consideration, which is in relation to finances, cash and debtors. Um, and if I could have the next slide there, please, Tara. Um, one of the things we did in actually compiling this section is we reached out to our, we, we, we compiled a focus group, um, some, some, some of which are represented in our panel discussion today, Get some actually insights on the key matters that directors of owners management companies need to be considering on a regular basis regarding the finances. And as seen in that slide, and I won't read out the slide, but as it's seen, the guide does share insights on the type of financial information that the director should be regularly reviewing. That is not so, that is not on an annual basis. That is on a regular basis. Almost at every meeting, there should be a little cheat sheet, if you like, with these statistics in terms of. How, 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 the, um, how the finances of the, of the organization are doing. And David, I think you had something on debt collection, was it? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Neil. I suppose the, the biggest challenge uh, facing most OMCs is, uh, is the collection of, of service charges, um, be that for the for the day-to-day -day running of the estate or the accumulation of a sinking fund. And uh, really we, we, can't, uh, we can't overstate the importance, I suppose, of, uh, of applying time uh, and and resources to that uh, to that particular uh, to that particular topic uh, and 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 really I suppose while there's a statutory obligation in in section 18 of the Mud Act on owners to pay there's there's a, an onus on on directors to uh, to ensure that uh, that there is uh, sufficient uh, time uh, uh, director time given to uh, to debt to debt collection so there's some guidance uh, in relation for example to the appointment of uh, and, and and this ties in with earlier observations. The appointment of perhaps a subcommittee of the board, so two or three directors mm -hmm. to come together and and focus on uh, debt uh, debt collection uh, for the benefit of the of the company's um, sustainable uh, sustainable financial um, uh, financial um, position. And and I think our our next uh, our next section um, refers to to uh, company accounts uh, and the uh, and the statutory. Uh, the statutory audit of of the uh, of the company, which again is is very important from a corporate uh, corporate governance uh, perspective. 
Yeah, it's certainly doing it. This section, uh, it kind of, uh, again, it's amazing owner management company. They're typically small organizations and, uh, you know, with, 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 with small amounts of turnover in, in the most instances, you might have a few large ones, but it's amazing the amount of actual financial reporting that actually takes place within an owner's management company. You have the Section 17 Multi-Unit Development Act uh, annual report that's required to be produced. You have, you know, an owner's management company, even if you're producing that cheat sheet of statistics or, or financial information we referred to previously, you have your management accounts. Then you have your statutory financial statements. And then if you're going to the hassle of abbreviating your financial statements uh, for filing with the CRO, that's, that's another set of documents, et cetera. So this section kind of, again, very concisely distills each of these documents, what they are and what they represent to help kind of uh, demystify the various pieces of our previous reporting requirements within an owner's management company. This section also, as David pointed out, deals with the area of audit and considerations as to whether an audit is required by law or by the members. There will be, without getting into too much detail, situations where audits are required by law, but in other instances, the audits are actually a requirement by the members themselves. They actually want to have the company audited. And what we have said here, again, is, is, is bearing in mind proportionality is in the position of electing to have an audit performed, you might want to consider what you want to achieve from the process and whether there are alternative assurance engagements that would be more appropriate for an owner's management company rather than carrying out a full-scale audit. And again, we just give some thought-provoking uh, pointers in there as, as to what you might consider. And that leads us to our seventh consideration in, in this guide is regarding the role of the company secretary, which I think, David, would you agree is a critical role in the governance of any organisation? Yeah, I suppose, Neil, we made reference to the role of the chair earlier on, but uh, mm. equally important in terms of the officerships of the uh, of the company is is the company secretary. So they they are uh, key to the to the good governance of of the OMC. They're responsible for preparing meeting minutes, uh, for making filings with the company's office, preparing agendas for for meetings, and often it's often it's a role that can be carried out by. Uh, or that is that is carried out by the uh, by the uh, property management agent, uh, and that that's a that's a person in the organisation or in the in the framework of the OMC that we haven't really touched on yet. But uh, I think I think we do have uh, some uh, quite quite a lot of meat, in fact, if you like, on on the role of um, of agents and indeed the wider topic of outsourcing uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 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 the running of the OMC and. You know, it's important for directors to remember that while they can outsource roles such as the company secretarial function, it is the board as a collegiate body, body that is ultimately uh, ultimately responsible for uh, for any of the of the filings and or any of the tasks uh, under, undertaken uh, under under outsourcing. And I think Neil, you probably have a bit more to say about that. No, no, I think you've said it all there, David. I mean, you're right. I mean, the, the, the owners management companies, by their nature, again, proportionality comes into play here. They don't have staff of their own, so. The directors either do it or they outsource it. And again, the property management agent is probably a vital um, uh, provider here in terms of helping them to keep uh, the manage the estate, look after the building, etc. So um, they, they have to outsource these functions. Likewise, many of them will outsource to a bookkeeper, to an accountant, to an auditor, um, etc., legal advisor. So that 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 is actually a very important section for consideration. Um, I think, David, in our penultimate consideration is regarding AGMs, uh, many of which are happening virtually these days. Uh, but while annual general meetings are formal, the, in, David, I think we'd agree in, in, in the context of an owner's management company, they're not just an opportunity to discuss accounts, are they? No, they really are the, the opportunity for, for members, for homeowners, be they uh, landlords uh, or owner occupiers. And again, there are different Different types of uh, different types of owners in 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 the in the sector, and it's something maybe our panelists might might touch on uh, in more detail. But but abs absolutely, it's it's the opportunity for for the members, the homeowners, to ventilate their views on the running of of the company, to query uh, the directors as as the elected representatives for for the members, to query the directors on how they're running the company, uh, and to I suppose highlight uh, issues of of uh, of concern and issues of progress. Uh, at the uh, at the AGM and uh, and it is interesting that even uh, just this morning um, the Department of, of of Enterprise Trade and Employment announced that the uh, that the virtual uh, AGMs uh, and the company's miscellaneous act will continue now until the thirty first of of December of this year. Uh, so that's I think a positive a positive development uh, and as and uh, is worth is worth uh, noting hot hot off the press if you like. 
um, but but that's that's certainly certainly an aspect of AGMs that's been that's been new for everyone. Well done, Dave. And I think I think Tara, we have a slide there where we have the a, a sample agenda. Yeah. So within the guide as well, we produced that sample agenda. That was a lot of fun, wasn't it, Dave? <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a useful uh, a useful steer for people. Uh, we we've tried to encapsulate most of of the issues that typically come up. There are obviously statutory requirements at the AGM, and then there are some what we might call discretionary uh, or or variable aspects. And we we've tried to to capture those again. Uh, we would we would uh, enter the enter the caveat uh, that uh, uh, all the material is. Is is is, uh, is is general in nature in in, in and, and each each particular OMC should consider its own individual circumstances and and seek the advice of of, of expert professionals. Again, I mentioned it earlier, but that is a thread that we're we're anxious to uh, to, to 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 emphasise. Um, and and equally, um, uh, our last uh, our last point really, I think we're we're on, we're on to is uh, dispute uh, dispute resolution. So we have some resources there, Neil. I think. That's right. We've we've provided. Uh, I mean, disputes. Unfortunately, given their nature, you never know where they're going to arise. If you if, if you did, you would you would avoid them. So, uh, we've we've included uh, quite a number of links there as to various different sources that can help you resolve disputes. And actually, in fairness, we've also included links as to piece sources of information that might help you to avoid the dispute in the first place. But this goes back, David, to the board effectiveness. This goes back to the common sense and practicality of the people involved in the board. This isn't actually rocket science, if I may say so. It is actually a bunch of people coming together to manage the common areas of a residential uh, premises. You know, we're, we're not getting into financial instruments or any complicated things. So it's, it, 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 it's uh, hopefully disputes can be avoided through good board effectiveness. And indeed, at the end of the day, it is, as, I, as we opened up, it is the directors who are ultimately responsible. And I guess that's what uh, Charter Accountants Ireland and the Housing Agency have sought to achieve with this guide. It's, it's, it's like we, we, Seven David have only touched, if you like, the surface in terms of, of, of some of the content. We hope the insights that are provided in this guide will, will steer many people away from disputes and ensure a focus of directors on achieving consensus to achieve, I suppose, to achieve, I suppose, at the end of the day, what's in the best interest of the owner's management company itself, its members at the end of the day who, have to, who reside there and live there and have own units there. And of course, it's many stakeholders, uh, be it county councils or be it the local communities in which these, these, these developments exist. So, Krona, thank you very much. I hope that gave everyone a flavour of what's in the guide and I shall hand back over to your capable hands. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, David, for those insights. I think it's it's very clear that good governance is key in all of this, um, not just to help the, the OMC meet its obligations, but also, you know, to meet the expectations of all the stakeholders that are involved here. So thank you for that very insightful insight into the guide. Um, I'm going to turn to the panel discussion now. Um, and we have three extremely experienced panelists in this area. First of all, we have Mary Tehan, who's a director on the R and Key Apartments Management Board. That's an apartment complex in Smithfield in Dublin. We also have Russell Grange, who's a director of property with Circle Voluntary Housing Association, which is a housing body responsible for tenancy services and asset management for 1,400 homes across Ireland. We also have Darren Flanagan, um, a chartered accountant, and he's managing partner in DMFN Chartered Accountants, a practice that currently audits in excess of 100 owner management companies annually. So we have wide ranging experience here from all different angles. So I'm just going to throw um, out, you know, a very general question, maybe to you, Russell, just to start off. I mean, you know, I know we, we probably have a lot of, of these directors in attendance today, um, obviously operating many of which are operating on a voluntary basis. Basis. So in terms of the guide itself, Russell, what was the kind of principal message you took from it? Um, well, I think first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's been involved in putting it together, because I think um, the sector has desperately needed some kind of plain English guide to uh, the responsibilities of a director. So I think the first thing I suppose I took away from it was uh, that it was pretty comprehensive in terms of what it offered. Um, and it was pretty straightforward in terms of the information that was provided. Um, and I suppose the other item that I would identify is, I mean, despite experience of both um, being involved with the management of estates, also being a, an OMC director um, in a couple of locations, uh, there's always things that you don't actually know. And uh, this guide identified the fact that there was things that I wasn't even aware of that, uh, that principally, you know, all, all company directors need to, to be aware of. And 
Um, and I think probably the main thing, I mean, most people that join a board of directors probably quite diligently may look at the MUD Act, for instance. You might not necessarily go away and look at the Companies Act, uh, which is uh, equally as a powerful document in, in respect to your fiduciary duty. So, um, so I think there's some really useful information there, which will probably uh, help uh, a lot of people not have to go away and read um, some pretty sizable statutory documents in order to understand what their responsibilities and roles should be. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in a world where we're inundated with information, that's probably a, a good thing. And Mary, just I suppose expanding on some of Russell's points, what are do you see as the typical challenges that some directors currently face and how can they best address some of these challenges? Um, not to be overly, overly simplistic, but I suppose the biggest challenge is getting people on the board. Uh, getting people to volunteer. So the big advantage I see from this document is um, six years ago, I kind of uh, didn't voluntarily volunteer, was put on the spot by a fellow resident. But six years later, I'm still here. Um, it This document demystifies, to use uh, Neil's word, um, what you need to know. And I think just thinking of when I was put on that spot, I was terrified of the responsibility and what I didn't know and didn't understand what I could bring to it. Um, I thought you would have to have a huge knowledge of accounts, of the legal aspects, et cetera. Uh, I didn't have any of that. I don't speak, speak the, the numbers language. Um, so it's, it's that, it's helping people to volunteer. And a document like this really does give you the confidence that you can live up to the responsibility um, that you have for other people in an apartment complex. Absolutely, because you're representing, a, you know, people's lively, you know, lives and their living arrangements. So it's, it's a really, really important role. So I'm glad to hear that the, the guide can can help in that manner. And Darren, I mean, you know, you you obviously audit a lot of these um, these companies. I mean, in terms, you know, how relevant is an audit? How important is it that these these um, companies are audited? And how different is it to say other normal other companies that you'd have experience with? Um, I think for my own experience, um, these companies kind of differ because you have an awful lot of members involved in the AGNs and you have an awful lot of members input. And um, invariably, you know, you'll always have, through my experience, I've always found that there's a, a, a myth going around that something has gone gone on, that's untoward at a director's level. You know, maybe that's a, a myth that's been born through a bad past experience. Um, it's not that a, an audit will actually uh, find all of those 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 items if there is anything in there. Um, but it's no guarantee that an auditor can come along and say to you that absolutely everything is 100% correct in an OMC. Um, but what I find is that uh, once members understand that somebody has come along independently and tested um, certain areas of the audit management company and um, they seem to be uh, more happy that uh, the management company is being run correctly. Notwithstanding the fact that in my own experience 99.9% .9 of owners management companies are being run correctly by the directors and um, there just seems to be something there in OMCs that doesn't exist in privately management companies um, and it's probably because people are actually uh, paying OMC fees themselves is coming out of hard-earned money and they just want some kind of um, some they just want a second opinion as to whether or not their hard-earned money has been put to good use. No, uh, no abs absolutely um, and you know I take the point about you know members are coming to the AGM and they want to see the accounts they want to see the I suppose the somebody else has looked at them and verified them and I, I totally get that point. So in terms of just, I suppose, Darren, just when you're looking at the accounts for an OMC, is there any particular considerations that, that you would be looking at? You know, I mean, what should directors in their role be looking for and looking at when they are preparing uh, or involved in the preparation of these accounts? Um, we found is some directors will request notes to be put into the accounts that really, you know, have no relevance going into a set of accounts. And a lot of that is a misinterpretation between Companies Act versus MUD Act requirements, in particular, say, Section 17 of the MUD Act. Um, mostly what we, we try to ensure is that income is complete 
that the expenses that are incurred have actually been incurred and that they are complete and that there is a process in place for debt collection um, and that debt debtors are actually, we would look at post year end to make sure that the debtors are actually collectible. And we would also inquire of directors then as to uh, what the debt collection policies are. Um, but invariably what you will find is that the directors, um, most directors boards um, understand sets of accounts and the only kind of mismatch really occurs when directors have read the MUD Act and there might be a slight misinterpretation as to how that marries into the Companies Act. And I do believe that on reading the guide that you guys, that Neil has prepared there, um, along with David, uh, I do believe this guide will, will alleviate an awful lot of those misinterpretations. I, and, and I suppose leading on from that, Mary, um, you know, part of the guide does suggest that, you know, when in doubt, perhaps professional advice should be sought. How important do you think this is, you know, for, I suppose, giving peace of mind or, you know, fulfilling your duty as a director? You know, should you be afraid to ask? Definitely not. I think you should admit your ignorances and not pretend that you know anything that you don't. Um, I think uh, a good management company uh, is very important, um, as in a good uh, property management company has been great support to us. We have a debt collection uh, uh, system in place with them, and we keep that 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 discussion earlier of it regular, not just at the end of the year, but regularly, monthly monitoring the accounts and debt collection. It's just part of our monthly meeting. It's it's we're used to it. We have confidence with it. That's important. Um, I, I think that monthly monitoring is key to the success of our own um, good management. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Russell, you know, in terms of, I suppose, uh, you know, the board's composition, you know, conscious that a lot of the board is comprised of voluntary, voluntary members, you know, how best do you think should, should the board rotate? How, you know, how regularly should the board rotate? Should you, you know, how, how do you get the right people essentially on board and, um, you know, to, to make this OMC effective? I think that's that's a huge challenge, to be honest with you. Um, getting volunteers for an OMC is is, is always very difficult. I think. Um, I mean, it really does depend on the estate that that um, uh, and obviously I suppose the interest of the the homeowners. Um, I think uh, probably a lack of understanding in many instances for residents in terms of what the OMC actually does, what they're responsible for, and also what the director's responsibilities are, are probably barriers to getting people on board. Um, I mean, ideally, you want a real mix of of people um, uh, with with uh, a really good interest in 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 the in the local community, um, and that want to be able to you know um, be able to uh, spend their time in in, in supporting their local community and, and 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 creating a better environment for for everybody. And uh, I think you know most residents probably want that, but in terms of understanding the kind of the time and commitment uh, and their responsibilities in in doing that by becoming a director of an OMC, uh, it's probably a barrier. So I think like anything really, it's education. So I think you know through the AGMs. Uh, you know, certainly uh, property managing agents really need to make sure that they're giving as much information to all members in relation to the responsibilities of the OMC, uh, the areas of, uh, of challenge as well, because I mean, you might have somebody that's resident within uh, your community that has a particular skill set that could really lend itself to the OMC that could really help and support. Um, so I think um, by educating residents as much as possible and putting the information out there and guys like this are, are, are a really big help in doing that. Uh, it will it will hope, hopefully encourage more people to come forward. In terms of rotation, um, you know, uh, every year you 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 have uh, uh, at the AGM you you uh, have to state who the directors are, um, and every three years you'll get somebody that will have to resign. So I mean, there is kind of a rotation already kind of built in, I suppose, in terms of uh, the requirements um, for directors in relation to that. But uh, what I tend to find is actually a lot of a lot of the directors that are committed tend to stay on. Uh, a lot longer than maybe they want to, or maybe they they should do, um, due to a lack of people actually putting themselves forward. So you tend to find that people do end up uh, as directors for, for many years before actually stepping down or actually moving away from the area, which forces them to do so. So, um, so, but I think, you know, you want, you know, you want regular fresh blood because you want there to be a regular interest. You don't want people to be there because they feel that uh, they have a responsibility because nobody else will do it. So, um, so again, I think that level of education and maybe the next guide needs to be to, to residents where an OMC exists uh, to encourage people to become directors. Uh, maybe that's something that needs to be thought about as well. 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think the guide, the current guide probably has a role in that demystifying as, as the, the hot, hot word at the moment, but, you know, and encouraging people to get on board and, uh, and, you know, you know, get involved. I suppose one area, and I, I'm, I'm conscious of time, might, this might be our, our last question. I'm probably going to ask each person on the panel for an answer. You know, sustainability in the green agenda is such a hugely important area at the moment. Um, obviously, we've got the Climate Action Bill out there at the moment, and um, there's all sorts of targets in terms of reducing our carbon emissions. Do OMCs have a role in this space? You know, I'm, I'm thinking things like when apartments, houses are being retrofitted um, for green energy um, to you know to increase the use of green energy etc is, is there a role is there an important role for a director of an OMC here you know to push that messaging out and um, Mary I might start with you if you, do, if you don't mind well uh, yes I do I do think so I think everyone every homeowner does uh, one thing we have looked at is the sustainable energy uh, authority of Ireland they have a, a program called the sustainable energy communities mm -hmm. and this can you get together uh, it can be uh, houses and a church and a business it can be a mix of anything but it has to be a mix so as a as apartment complexes you're perfect um, what you do is you apply for a grant of about 10,000 and you get a, a master energy plan done so an expert makes recommendations as to how you can change your apartment complexes both the apartments and the common areas and what is best for you solar panels um, uh, heat pumps, etc. So you get this grant, and then you are entitled to further grants to buy the solar panels the following year to put in the heat pump, etc. Uh, I would recommend that we're we're going to do it next year. So it's something to think of, and there's plenty of help out there for um, owner management companies uh, through the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite a mouthful, the SEAI, but yeah, you're absolutely right, there are so many grants and helps out there, it's just yeah. that communication piece of getting the information out there. And Russell, do you have anything to add to the to the green agenda? Uh, yeah, so I think um, I think it's probably a challenge in most, most estates is trying to have an effective asset management strategy for, you know, the long-term plan maintenance uh, within an estate. And um, quite typically, uh, in my experience, a lot of people look to see that they're, you know, the service charges don't change from year to year, or if anything, they're going down now. I mean, quite typically, um, you know, if effective management of finances would allow you to try to uh, maintain a certain level for a period of time, um, but you obviously need proper investment into a sinking fund in order to ensure that um, the, the correct level of plan maintenance is carried out. And that needs to be assessed based on the needs of the estate, as opposed to, you know, putting it down as minimum value of, of a sinking fund that you're able to in, uh, for, you know, based on the, the guidelines in the MUD Act, which is 250 euro per, per home per year. Um, so I think, you know, so I, I think, I mean, the sustainability agenda is, is definitely um, is definitely a big one and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be something that will come more and more to the fore, but that's something that needs to be considered as part of that asset management strategy in order to ensure that, uh, you know, everybody's getting a benefit from, from those, those uh, inputs. Um, I mean, we have a, a few OMCs that, you know, we, where we, we act as agents for, um, and certainly the ones that are more cash rich in terms of their sinking fund are already looking at that, that kind of guidance, that kind of uh, level of investment. How can they reduce the overall energy bills for, you know, within the common parts of the, of the blocks and that type of thing. And I think, you know, it's, it's really good thinking because at the end of the day, what that's going to do is it's going to reduce some of your, your most sizable costs, which tend to be around your utilities, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it, there's definitely a benefit in that, but it does need to be, you know, you need good guidance and you, uh, you know, from third party consultants, you know what they're talking about and good planning in terms of your, you know, your budgetary requirements in order to deliver on those things as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the role of an accountant will be very important there. And I, I know, Darren, I'd love to get to you, but I think we've we've run out of time. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure you have certain you know, comments to make in terms of all the reporting requirements that are going to come down the line for, for OMCs in terms of reducing emissions and all that sort of stuff. But that's a conversation for another day. And um, so thank you to um, our panelists uh, for that very interesting discussion. I'm going to hand you over to John O'Connor, who's going to wrap up proceedings. And um, John is the chief executive officer of the housing agency and was previously CEO of the Affordable Homes Partnership and Executive Manager in the Housing and Communities Department of Dublin City Council. So, John, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cronin, and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just make a, a few uh, final comments. Uh, the first thing is, over the last 20 years, the number of apartments in Ireland has increased by over 90%. So we've had a, a huge increase in the number of apartments. 
the number of multi-unit devel developments have been very, very significant. Hence, you know, we're, we're talking on this in this topic. Uh, and in 2019, for the first time, planning permissions for apartments exceeded uh, those for houses. You know, so this, you know, again, it's just showing in terms of where things are going. And this is coupled with uh, national planning uh, policies, which are towards greater density, uh, trying to move away from urban sprawl. Um, and this is coupled with the fact that the average household size has, has decreased, you know, very significantly, you know, over the last number, number of decades. And one fact which may, many would already have heard is that 55% of households, so well over half of households now are households of one or two persons. So it is kind of really significant. In terms of owner management companies, it is really important kind of high standards of shared amenities, uh, good services, and a properly run uh, owner management company uh, can help to develop a sustainable community, you know, and create apartments and other um, multi-unit development to be good places to live. And, and good estate management on the ground is associated with, with good governance and a well-run uh, owner management companies. As we've discussed, kind of most directors of owner management companies are volunteers. So it is great to have this practical uh, and straightforward forward guidance you know, as a resource for those who are on owner management companies and also the guide then points to further information or guidance uh, as needed. We're facing major uh, challenges in, in housing and, and we see that in the last week in terms of, of all the discussions and we're going to have stamp duty changes uh, introduced this evening and, and in legislation over, over the next month and other planning changes um, to address some of, some of our housing issues. Our big issues are really to do with housing supply and affordability, but also most critically, kind of having well-managed housing is, is so important. You know, so, so in terms of, of the role of owner management companies and the growing role of owner management companies in the future is, is so critical to have uh, good housing and good places for people, people to live. And coming back to today, I mean, it's great to have collaboration between the public sector and professional bodies and we need that collaboration, we need to work together in terms of providing long-term uh, sustainability of homes in, in Ireland. As uh, Barry Dempsey said earlier, the um, Charter Council of Ireland has got a public in, in interest mandate and he referred to the Royal Charter, um, which sets out that the um, accountants should act for the public benefit and it's so, you know, so critical in terms of, of the, for the character of the organization and character of its members um, in, in how it's recognized uh, that it's acting in, in the interest of the community. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a major ob objective set out in the, in the charter. Um, Kroner raised the issue of the kind of green agenda and sustainability. Uh, the housing agency, its full name is actually the Housing and Sustainable Communities Agency. So in terms of what we're discussing here, in terms of sustainable communities is the most important thing that we have to aim for. And we have major challenges. Uh, we have a climate change challenge that we really all have to really focus on addressing. And coupled with that, we have a biodiversity crisis. So, uh, you know, it's and, and it's separate from the climate change crisis. So again, what owner management companies can do to help to, to address that. And there was a, a number of very good suggestions uh, and supports through SEAI uh, mentioned, mentioned there. Uh, the a sincere thanks to Krona uh, and the panelists, uh, Mary Russell and Darren. Uh, thanks uh, to Barry Dempsey and to Jill Farley of Chartered Council Ireland and to all of the housing agency team involved in the publication and the launch. Above all, I'd like to thank uh, Neil Fitzgerald and David Rouse for their work in producing this guide. I think when you look at it, you, you'll find it, it is an excellent guide and it'll be a major assistance to owner management companies. 
So I'd advise you all kind of involved in that area to read the guide and, and make use of it. Uh, as was mentioned in the chat, there was a lot of questions there in, 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 chat, in the chat. If anybody has any questions they want to ask or any, any issues they need um, clarification on, if you write to mud at housingagency.ie, that's M-U-D at housingagency.ie. Uh, thank you very much. I'll hand you back to Claude there. Thank you, John. Um, and just to echo John's thanks to every, to all the speakers, the panelists, Barry. Um, and I hope everyone found the, infer, the the event informative. And again, our the guide is available to download on our websites. And a recording will be made and it will be made available. So thank you to everyone. I hope you have a lovely afternoon and take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone.